Matthew 11, verses 16 through 30. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, that you speak out of it to us. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, would you allow me to teach in a way that is helpful, that is accurate, and that honors the Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I pray for everyone listening. I pray that their ears would be open, that their minds would be attentive and, and ready to hear, and that their hearts would be moved by you and would be moved to faith. For all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, for 10 chapters, Matthew has presented Jesus as the true king. Uh, it's been every single chapter has been Jesus is the one who was promised. Jesus is the one uh, who has all authority. Authority actually is kind of a, a big deal in these early chapters of Matthew. Uh, Matthew goes through that Jesus has authority over sickness, over death, over the demonic, over nature itself, and Jesus has authority to forgive sins. Uh, now, what's amazing in this for the Jew, and really for us as we read it and as we follow the storyline, is that that in and of itself is a claim to the identity of Jesus, namely a claim to deity. Matthew presents Jesus is the promised Messiah. Jesus is the coming King. Jesus, in fact, is God in the flesh come to save his people. And so now, as we shift into chapter 11, we are confronted with a choice. Uh, the reader throughout the ages has had to make a determination. Do we accept Jesus? Do we reject Jesus? Right? That's, that's basically where Matthew has led us to. Uh, in the previous section that we covered last week, we saw John the Baptist. He is in prison. His life has not gone as he planned. He sends his disciple and he said, Jesus, I, I have some doubts. I have some questions. Are you the one or should we wait for another? And in that context, as Jesus kindly and tenderly deals with John's doubt, he says this. He says, blessed is anyone who is not offended by me. So Jesus is saying it's going to hinge on your response to me. Today, 
we're going to keep moving. We're going to see people that are indifferent. And we're going to see people that are hostile. We're going to see people that, that have unbelief despite overwhelming evidence uh, to Jesus' identity, his power, uh, and the reason he came. And then we have an invitation to faith. I think this section very much is an invitation by Jesus to, to anyone, to all the people, to come to him. It's not unique. Throughout Scripture, we see multiple times that Jesus presents himself, shows himself as the one who ultimately makes this invitation. Right? We, we see the, the great story in Luke of the banquet. Uh, a, a great man, probably a king, is holding a banquet and he sends invitations. We see it again in the book of Revelation, right? Where in chapter 3, verse 20, it says that I stand at the door and I knock. See, Jesus is eager to enter, eager for people to open the door and then he would come in and he would have the evening meal with them. He would enter into relationship. He would enter into a close, personal intimate relationship with those who open the door to him. And here, we'll get there in the, in the kind of the, the course of the sermon, Jesus invites. I believe he invites non-believers to faith. I believe he invites Christians, believers, to come to him anew, come to him in a, in a way to just Bring their burdens, bring their sorrows, bring their mistakes and their failures and their sins, and once again, lay them at the feet of Jesus. Well, this invitation by Jesus uh, ultimately is for you today. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your background is, it doesn't matter whether you believe yet or if you've been a Christian for many, many years. I think there's an invitation in our text, for all of us. So, so maybe let me, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you weary? Are you burdened? Are you struggling? Are you dealing with fear? Are you dealing with sin? Are you dealing with your inability to cope? What's going on in your, in your life? What's going on in your heart? What, what is happening right now? Are you overcome, as John the Baptist, with doubt? Are you overcome with just the reality of your own sin and you, just, you feel so unworthy of the love of God? My, my hope, my prayer is that as we kind of move through this text, as we explore this text, that you would receive and you would accept the invitation that Jesus makes. And you would come to him. Uh, if, you, if you're not yet a believer, my hope is that you would come to Jesus in faith and say, yes, Jesus, I don't understand it all. I don't get it all. But I know I need you. I need you to come and be my Savior. Uh, for those of you who are believers, man, I, my hope is that with your burdens, you wouldn't hold on to them. You wouldn't try to just manage on your own, but you would come to the Savior and lay them down at his feet. All right, uh, that's enough preamble. Let's take a look at the text. Jesus is uh, still talking to the crowd in regard to John the Baptist. He's uh, defended his honor, if you will. He said John was a legitimate prophet. His message was true and his life exemplary, right? He is in jail, and people could say, oh, well, is he really the one who was the forerunner. And Jesus defends him. And then he goes on and he says, man, you guys are hard to please. You guys are just really a challenge for any person coming to bring the word of God to you. And really he, in some ways, addresses the indifference of the people of his generation. Let me, let me just read it and make some comments to this. This is, the section is, verses 16 through 19. Jesus, almost a little bit exasperated, says this. He says, but to what shall I compare this generation? So these are the people that have heard the message of John. These are the people that have seen the miracles of Jesus and, and that are hearing Jesus speak right now. To, to what shall I compare this generation? 
And now Jesus makes up a story, an analogy right here on the spot to show them what's going on. He says, it's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. All right, just so you, you have kids, just, they're running around the town square, they're all over the, the, the city, all over the village. Like in those days, right, they, the kids would be outdoors, they would be running around, they would be maybe doing a little menial tasks for their parents, or maybe they're just hanging out with the other village kids, and they're having a good time, and they're playing. And the two kind of games that they were playing were taken from what was normal life, right? Normal life in those villages would be, and the two kind of big events would be marriage, so wedding, and funeral. Both were public, uh, kind of do it for, for a marriage feast. The whole town would get invited, and it would be like a seven-day affair. And you, you would have the bride, and you would have the bridegroom, and you would have the attendants of the bride, and then you would have the friend of the bridegroom. You would have the officiant, and there would be a procession, and there would be a big feast, and, and kids would play wedding. Uh, I don't know if you, if you have uh, girls, but they might play wedding, right? In, just in your basement. They're like, oh, let's get all dressed up. And maybe they found mom's heels and maybe they, they, you know, whatever is going on. But there is a feast and this is what's happening there. Or maybe they would play funeral. It was another very, very public event in those days. Uh, and, and it was the whole town, the whole uh, community was engaged in it. And it was a procession uh, as there was a dead a death in the, the area. They would have professional mourners that would show up. They would have wailing women. Right? They showed up and they cried and they called out. and uh, It was a big thing. And there were mournful songs, dirges that were sung. Now, this is what Jesus says. It's this generation you like these children sitting in the marketplace and you're calling to your playmates. We played the flute for you. We played wedding. We had a great time. But you didn't participate. You were indifferent to our efforts. We played the flute. We had everything ready. Everyone was playing, but, but you didn't dance. And then we figured, well, you didn't like that. Let's do something different. We'll, we'll adjust to your desires. We sang a dirge. We played funeral. And yet, you did not mourn. You didn't participate. You were indifferent to our efforts to include you in our gameplay. Now Jesus explains his analogy, his story, by what he means. He says, well, John, John the baptizer, uh, he came neither eating nor drinking. He kind of lived a really ascetic, austere life. Right? He, he wore a cloak of camel hair. He lived out in the desert uh, he was a Nazarite, so he uh, wasn't cutting his hair. He wasn't drinking wine. He wasn't having any, any delicacies. And, and so John, this prophet, shows up. And you say, oh, this guy is strange. This guy is weird. This guy, oh, uh, he has a demon. No one is that weird. Living out in the desert, living in the open air, living away from people, and then calling us to repentance? He's crazy, right? And so what, what people got to do is, you're calling me to repentance, but if you're crazy, I don't have to listen. Hmm, interesting, right? That, that is their approach to John. If John is crazy, if John is demon-possessed, and he is saying, repent, turn from your wickedness, be ready for the coming of the kingdom, but if he's demonically possessed if he's crazy you don't have to listen it's great awesome and then the son of man that's jesus favorite title for himself we actually explored what where that came from out of daniel 7 right the son of man so the messiah came eating and drinking and they say look at him a glutton and a drunkard right so this guy has all kinds of issues He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Okay, so if John has a demon, Jesus is just a vile sinner. 
We don't need to listen to him. We don't need to listen to his message. We don't need to learn from him. We don't need to like, pay attention to the Sermon on the Mount and love our enemies and repent like John said because John has a demon and Jesus, he was just a vile sinner, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So Jesus says, you guys, you dismissed the messengers that God has sent you and you were indifferent to the message. But wisdom is justified by her deeds. And so what Jesus is saying is, John, he brought, he prepared the way of the Lord. He prepared the way for Israel to see and to receive its Messiah. So his deeds were that of preaching the truth, of preparing the way, and of announcing, behold, the Lamb of God. All right, so that's John. How about Jesus? Jesus brought the joy of the kingdom. He brought the truth of a loving God who was ready to receive his own. He brought not a message of condemnation, he brought a message of salvation. He didn't come to condemn and to put down, he came to seek and to save the lost. And so Jesus says, wisdom is justified by its deeds. In James, actually, we read, Man, you say you have faith, and you try to demonstrate that with just your words. Let me show you my faith by what I do. So what we do always, ultimately, is, oh, yeah, that's what it is. We're not sure, then we see how they act, now we're sure. Jesus and John are examples of that. And so Jesus says, man, this generation, you, you're so indifferent to an extent and when you're not indifferent, and when you kind of can't avoid the message anymore, then you try to discredit the messenger. And you make it so you don't have to listen. But oh, would that you had listened. Because what your response to John's message of repentance is, would your response what to my message of the kingdom is here, the king has arrived, and that you need to come to God in repentance and in faith, that is going to determine your eternal destiny. All right? And so Jesus is, is just calling the people to himself. This next section is from verses 20 to 24. Jesus then is saying that there is a consequence for unbelief. There, there is a, a, a resultant judgment for those who refuse to repent. Right, let me read it for us. He says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So his mighty works, it's essentially his miracles. Uh, it is him healing the blind man. It is him cleansing the leper. It is him multiplying bread for food, right? Like feeding the multitudes. Those would be his mighty deeds. There's others, right? His stilling the storm, walking on water, etc. So Jesus is saying, man, you cities, and he's going to name three for us, you've seen more miracles than any other place in Israel and in the surrounding nations. And yet your response has been one of unbelief. Your response has been lacking. And instead of repenting and turning to God, you refused. So, so when Jesus says, uh, believe on account of the miracles, he's saying, all of the miracles I do, they're evidence. The evidence of my identity, the evidence of the blessing of God on my ministry, and they're ultimately, they're, they're not just like, oh, that was incredible and something to be gaped at. Oh, what a crazy event. No, like ultimately what Jesus is saying these miracles, these mighty works, they're not just a validation of my claims, they're an invitation. There's an invitation to consider how glorious, how mighty God is. They're an invitation to consider that God, in fact, in the person of Jesus, has drawn near to the people. Then invitation to contemplate your relationship with God. Where are you? 
Are you okay? <laughs> or does John's call to repentance need to be heeded in your life? What's your relationship with God like? And do you need to repent and turn to God and experience from Him forgiveness and cleansing and refreshment? Right? That, that is ultimately the, the invitation of these mighty deeds. And he says, now, most of my mighty deeds were done in these three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And yet, you did not repent. So Capernaum is uh, its still around today. There's, it's, I mean, it's all ruins, but it's very beautiful. There's a huge synagogue. Uh, Peter's house actually is there. It's right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's in the very northern tip of the Sea of Galilee, and it became Jesus' headquarters. Uh, it's actually like the Gospels talk about that Jesus returned to his own city, and what they're talking about is Capernaum. So we believe that he, he stayed with Peter, who had a pretty large house, and made that his ministry headquarters. And then just north of there are two other towns. Bethsaida, which the Bible says actually was the hometown of Peter, Andrew, and Philip, and Chorazin. And Chorazin uh, is in that same exact region. Now, archaeologists have tried to find them. One uh, is really, there's, there's not a lot there. The other is now actually under the waters of the Sea of Galilee. And then Capernaum is essentially just a tourist spot. And he, here's what Jesus is saying. He, it says he denounced these cities. Now, verse 21, he says, Woe to you. Now, woe is this idea of how terrible it is for you. Oh, this is awful. It's not... It's not necessarily a call for, oh, I'm going to judge you, there's going to be vengeance. It is more, it is warning, compassion, but really a, a, in a stronger way. Strong warning, strong compassion, a longing that they would act differently. Uh, here's what he says. Verse 21, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, sackcloth and ashes, are, uh, the, they are this rough garment that was always associated with death, with mourning, but also with humbling oneself and repenting. All right, So that, basically that is what, what you have uh, with sackcloth and ashes. Uh, when Jonah goes to Nineveh and he preaches that, hey, 40 days, and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. What the king does is he says, Let, let's, let's repent. We need sackcloth and ashes. And they actually put sackcloth on their cows, on their, their livestock. All right? So that was a, a pretty wide a spread repentance right there. And, and so he's, what Jesus says here is he mentions two cities, Tyre and Sidon. That would have been north of Israel, right on the seacoast. So these are port cities. Uh, and the, these are evil cities. Actually, throughout Isaiah, Ezekiel, I think it's in chapter 28, uh, there's multiple times Amos, I think, also denounces Tyre and Sidon. And these port cities were centers for Baal worship, so pagan cities, pagan worship. Uh, there were places where the, all the seafaring people came in, so uh, there was all kinds of sexual immorality, debauchery. It, it was a mess, and they were considered by Israelites as wicked, evil cities. Now, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, if these wicked, evil cities had seen what you saw, had experienced what you experienced, had gotten a chance to witness what you witnessed in the miracles that the Son of God has done, right? And when you read through the Gospels, you see the miracles. Like in Bethsaida, he is healing a blind man. In, right, Bethsaida is connected to him feeding the 5,000. Wow. And he says, if they would have seen it, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Okay, he says this twice. More bearable, more tolerable. It, it, it seems, and, and some people have created a really complicated theology out of this, but it seems 
that there is levels of judgment. Well, we know from Scripture for sure that there's levels of reward, all right? In, in heaven, there's levels of reward. So there seems to be indicated right here that there's levels of judgment. And Jesus is saying, yes, these pagan, wicked, evil cities, they're better off than you will be on the day of judgment. Now he says, and you, Capernaum, the city with a big synagogue, it's beautiful, like even the ruins of it are beautiful. Capernaum, where all my miracles were done. Capernaum, where I made my headquarters. Will you be exalted to the heavens? You feel so good about yourself? You're like, oh, look at me. I'm Capernaum. We're the people of Capernaum. We're so godly. We're so righteous. Look at us. Look at our beautiful city. <laughs> he says, no. You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, all right, yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah, the one that God like rained sulfur on, completely destroyed, can't find it, don't know where it is. The, the city of Sodom, which was synonymous for the Jew with wickedness and evil, they, they were proud and arrogant. They were evil and were lacking compassion. They had all kinds of sexual immorality. I mean, God sends his angels to Sodom to, like, you know, see the city, and the people of the city are like, we should rape these angels. That is the level of wickedness that we're talking about. And Jesus is saying, Capernaum, you think you're so great, but if Sodom had seen what you've seen, it would have remained to this day. And I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Wow, what, 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 is, what is Jesus saying here? I mean, it's, it's really, really significant. He's talking about heaven and Hades, heaven and hell. What he is saying is, heaven and hell is not a matter of ancestry. You Jewish towns, you think you're so much better than these pagan cities of Tyre and Sidon? It is not a matter of big sin or little sin. It is not a matter of religious activity. It is not a matter of, look what I do. I, I do all these righteous things. For the Jew, I go to synagogue. I eat kosher. You know, I give alms. It is not, oh, look at me. I go to church. I go to small group. Oh, I give a tithe. No, it is not a matter of, look at my good deeds. It's not a matter of, oh, he, he is my pedigree. Heaven and hell is not a matter of, at least I'm not as bad as fill in the blank. And if you run out of blank, then you go with Hitler, right? That's kind of the thing. You're like, at least I'm not as bad as Hitler. I mean, that guy, I mean, that guy was really evil. Yes. See, heaven or hell is a question of repentance and faith. Oh, wow. See, it is not, look at my pedigree, look at my good deeds. I have earned it. And if you are hearing this, if you are sitting here listening to this and you're like, no, but I'm pretty good. Let me tell you right now, it's not good enough. Because only the utter perfection of Jesus will suffice. And maybe you're like, well, at least I didn't do this. I never murdered anyone. Oh, I, I didn't, didn't commit adultery. It's not, I'm not as bad as. It is, oh, I believe, save me. See, that, that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you see the miracles you see the mighty works, and you refused to believe and repent. See, repentance, turning from your way and turn toward God to acknowledge, I'm not right, I'm not the final authority, you are. See, that is the beginning 
of salvation. It's the beginning of coming to Jesus and being saved by him. Based not on anything you've done, not on your pedigree, not on your upbringing, not on your ethnicity, not on your culture, not on your religiosity, not on your good deeds, not on your church attendance. No, based on his perfect life and based on his, Jesus, sacrificial death on the cross. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. And so he says, woe to you. How terrible is your end going to be because you would not believe, you would not turn to me. And now he turns to an invitation. And his invitation is really, really amazingly all-inclusive. He says, come to me. Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Let me, let me read it for us and let's, let's see the invitation of Jesus. Verse 25, at that time, Jesus declared. So Jesus is, is now saying something. He's saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. So he's exalting God the Father. He says, you are the creator. You are the Lord. You are the one to whom all praises do. You are the one to whom our allegiance is due. You are the one who is overall and receives and deserves our worship and our obedience. So I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and have revealed them to little children. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that the gospel message is so simple that a little child can understand it. Right? When, when we have our kids in kids' ministry, we go, what you need to know is that Jesus loves you and that Jesus is with you. That's the start, right? So, okay, Jesus loves me, Jesus is with me. And then we move on as they can comprehend this idea of wrongdoing and sin. Jesus forgives your sin. Oh, oh that's amazing. See, it is so simple. When Jesus comes, he comes for you. The reason Jesus came is because he loves you. When Jesus came, he died on the cross to bear the punishment that you deserved. So now you can be free. It's that simple. It's that simple. Right? And we, as adults, like, as wise and smart and Western-educated people, we just think, oh, how do I make it more complicated? It's not more complicated. Bow the knee and receive the Savior. That's it. And Jesus said, thank you. Thank you for uh, like, not being so hidden that only the wise can understand. Thank you for not being so lofty that only the important people can come and find you. Oh God, the humble, the lowly, the simple, the gospel is for those such as these. Man, that's awesome. Are you like, but I don't understand. You don't need to understand at all. Will you believe that Jesus has come to me? Come bring me your sin. Come bring me your failure. Come bring me your, your burdens. He says, oh, thank you, Father. Thanks that you have revealed these to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. First time Jesus says my Father. Okay, so before he said the Father, our Father, now he says my Father. Oh, wow. He says, I, I have received it all. I've received all authority, all power. I am God. See, that's, that's why people hated him. That's why they wanted to stone him in Nazareth. That's why they ultimately hung him on the cross. So all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son 
and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What Jesus is saying is, because the Father and I are one, I have an intimate, deep, unmatched, unrivaled, unparalleled knowledge of who he is. And in the same way, the Father has that same knowledge of me. And he says, now, like a lot of you are wanting to come to the Father. Lots of you are longing to be in his presence. And I'm telling you, you cannot know him and you cannot come to him. You cannot have relationship with him unless I choose. Oh, wow. So here's what Jesus is saying, right? He, he goes and says, no one can know the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. See, salvation is a miracle of God. It's a miracle of Jesus choosing you. It is not human effort. It is not human decision. It's not an accident. It's not perchance. No, if you are in here, if you are listening to this and you're like, I know Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I know I've come to the Father. My sins have been forgiven. My future is secure. I have hope and I believe. The reason that that's true is because Jesus, in love and tenderness, chose to reveal the Father to you. Actually, I want to show you this because it is super cool. Salvation is a miracle, yeah. It is a Trinitarian miracle. See, when we read through the Scriptures, what we find, we find that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, all are involved in leading sinners to repentance. Uh, let, me, let me show it to you. The first is in John uh, chapter 6. And, and there's, there's a whole thing where Jesus is talking about him and the Father. And that like, the Father gives to him those who would be saved. Uh, in verse 37 it says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. So Jesus is saying, hey, listen, the Father is the one who gives them to me. In verse 44, same chapter, it's even more clear. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, so if you come to Jesus, if you're right now, you're sitting and you're listening to this and you're feeling a draw and you're like, maybe this is true. Maybe Jesus is God. Maybe Jesus has come and it's possible that his forgiveness and his love is for me. This is the Father drawing you to Jesus to the Son. So the Father draws. And then the Son reveals, right? We just read it. It, it. it is those who know the Father to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Uh, in, in John chapter 14, we see that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Jesus says, I reveal the Father in all his beauty, in his majesty, in his glory, in his kindness, in his tenderness. I am the one. I am the, the visible representation of God's love to you. And then finally, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, uh, in chapter 16 of John, is a, a long passage. I'm not going to read it all. It's from verse 7 all the way down to verse 14. And Jesus says, it is such good news for you that I'm leaving. And the disciples go, what? Yeah, because if I didn't, the Holy Spirit couldn't come. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he is going to be your helper. He is going to bring conviction. He's going to be conviction regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. He is going to help you believe. He's going to help you remember. He is the one who is going to like enliven you, make you alive to be able to hear the call of the gospel and respond in faith. Salvation, according to Scripture, is a Trinitarian miracle of God the Father drawing, the Son revealing, and the Spirit convicting for His glory and for our good. 
How awesome is that? Now, Jesus has one final invitation. And, and, and this is, this is where, where I want us to, to end. Verse 28. Having talked about those who doubt, those who are indifferent, those who are hostile even and, and full of unbelief, those who refuse to repent, and now those little ones, the humble ones, the lowly ones, those to whom Jesus has chosen to reveal the Father, he, he finishes to them with this invitation. He says, come to me. Come to God. Run to Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Primarily, what Jesus is saying here, he's talking to those who are burdened by their sins, enslaved to their sin. He's talking to those who are trying to be right with God and could never do it. Those who are burdened by the law, those who are burdened by the requirements of self-righteousness. He's talking to those who are like, I just, I can't, I can't get there. I can't be good enough. Like, I, I, I claim that I'm so good and I'm at least I'm better than them, but like in the quiet of the night, I realize, oh no, who am I kidding? Because I know myself. And sometimes I'm afraid I don't even know the depth of my own sin and my own shortcomings. And, and Jesus says, come. Come bring those burdens. Come bring those burdens to me. Lay them at the cross. Come to me all who labor, who strive, who work so hard, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I'm not overbearing. I'm not proud. I'm not arrogant. I haven't come to destroy you. I've come to save you. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This isn't just an outward rest. This is a deep, soul-restoring, soul-refreshing rest. That, that the innermost part of you, that even if you're like, yeah, I, I slept 10 hours. <laughs> yeah, I had a good meal. Yeah, everything is great. I bought a really, really, really expensive mattress. See, this rest is not the same. What Jesus is saying, even though outwardly you might be burdened, I have rest for your soul that is superior. Resting from your striving to be righteous because I will give you my righteousness. Resting from you attempting to keep every bit of the law plus the hundreds of commandments that the Pharisees made up. Because I have come to fulfill the law for you. I, I want to give you rest because you are burdened by the realization that you will be headed toward punishment, headed toward hell, headed toward an eternity of suffering for your wrong. And Jesus says, I've already suffered. You don't need to do that. I want to give you rest. I want to give you comfort. I want to give you salvation. The word yoke here uh, is interesting. It uh, comes from plowing, comes from farming. And a yoke was basically... Uh, a wooden instrument that was put over the necks of oxen or donkeys, uh, and they would be yoked together, two of them. And what it would do is they would then pull the plow or pull the wagon, and the two of them together could pull weights that neither of them could carry. If you put it in the, in the wagon, if you like got the plow, th their strength all of a sudden translated into something much, much bigger. And often, they had a stronger ox that was already trained, already used to the farmer's commands with 
a newer, weaker ox. So when Jesus says, take my yoke, what he is saying is, I have already been the burden bearer. I have already carried the weight. I have already fulfilled the law for you. You don't need to strive for that. Bring me your burdens. Bring me your struggles and receive rest. But Jesus is saying, come to me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, if you are not a Christian, please come to Jesus. Receive his forgiveness and his new life today. If you are a believer and you're overburdened, maybe with sins that you just can't seem to be free of. Maybe with sorrows that are too big for you to carry. Maybe with anxieties and fears that are overwhelming your soul and are just causing all kinds of unrest. Come to Jesus. I, I believe this passage specifically talks about the salvation rest. But, but I think for those of us who i like, yeah, I'm not doubting my salvation, but I am burdened and overwhelmed and sorrowful. I, I believe there's a message in this for you. Jesus says, come. Come to me. Lay down your burden. Lay down your sorrow. Lay down your pain. Lay down your fear. And experience my closeness, my nearness. I'll help you carry that yoke. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to go into our time of communion. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming. Jesus, thank you for enduring the cross, bearing the yoke of the law and the yoke of my sin and and, and coming to set us free. God, I pray for every person uh, that is not yet a believer. God, save them. Father, I pray for every person that is a believer and needs to come to you anew. A person needs to come and keep coming to Jesus because only there rest for our souls can be found. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.